They were the first pieces of Schoenberg that Bartok encountered. Stravinsky supposedly studied them while composing The Rite of Spring. Kandinsky heard them in a concert and was inspired to make his painting Impression 3. The pianist Glenn Gould said about them, Perhaps no other composition was as crucial to Schoenberg's future, and if one accepts the eventualities of that future, then also to 20th century music as the three piano pieces Opus 11. After a performance in Berlin, the composer Max Reger wrote, I don't know if one can still call this music. My brain is too old. He was 37 at the time. So in this video I'm going to talk about Arnold Schoenberg's Drei Klavierstücke, Three Piano Pieces, Opus 11. I chose these pieces because I find them extremely expressive and intense and because they have this strange quality to them which is created through the coexisting of very familiar traditional musical elements on the one hand and very modern and new elements on the other hand. And also they were one of the first more modern pieces of music that I discovered and played. And my interest for new music basically began with Schoenberg and maybe it will be the same for you. First of all, let's understand how Schoenberg came about writing these exciting pieces. The Austrian mostly self-taught composer Arnold Schoenberg was born in the late 19th century. He was very influenced by all the traditional Germanic composers like Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, Wagner, Mahler and so on and learned most of his compositional technique by studying their scores. Schoenberg wanted to continue this Germanic musical tradition and saw his work as a logical continuation of that heritage. His compositional career can be divided into three periods. The Romantic period, in which he wrote very lyrical and passionate late Romantic music. The free atonal period, in which he wrote pieces without tonality, without a tonal center and where traditional harmony rules don't apply anymore. And by the way, Schoenberg and his students rejected the term atonality. They thought that it was absurd since atonal means without tones, which is obviously ridiculous but it has still become an established term. And finally, the dodecaphonic period in which Schoenberg invented and started using the 12-tone technique, which was a, a new system he felt he needed to organize his pieces. As you would expect, Schoenberg began his musical career writing music of his time, so late romantic music. Pieces from that early period are very much influenced by the lyrical chromaticism of Wagner and the motivic cohesion and inventiveness of Brahms, among many other things, of course. And you could compare it with the music of Richard Strauss or Gustav Mahler, who were near contemporaries of him. One of the earliest pieces of that period is the string quartet in D major, which actually Brahms really liked. He even offered to help Schoenberg by giving him money so that he could go study at the conservatory in Vienna. Let's listen to one of the most beautiful examples of this period. Verklärte Nacht, Transfigured Night for String Sextet. I had been a Brahmsian. When I met him, his love embraced both Brahms and Wagner. And soon thereafter, I was an addict of the same color. No wonder that the music composed at that time mirrored the influence of both these masters, to which a flavor of Liszt, Bruckner, and perhaps of Hugo Wolf was added. In this piece Schoenberg already goes very far in regards to harmony and there are moments in which there is no tonal center anymore. And actually a lot of his romantic pieces like his first string quartet in D minor or Peleas et Melisande already provoked scandals during the first performances. When Gustav Mahler was in the audience he would always protect Schoenberg. But 
last not least, there are already some passages of unfixed tonality which may be considered as premonitions of a future. After composing lots of these beautiful late romantic pieces, Schönberg felt the need to go further in his compositions. He felt that tonality had come to an end and that music had become so chromatic that there was no need for a tonal center anymore, that dissonances were so frequent that they should be treated like equals to consonances. He thought that composers were using dissonance sounds so much that returning to a tonal center, a simple consonant home, so to say, was not appropriate anymore. He saw it as a logical step to therefore abandon tonality and traditional harmony. The overwhelming multitude of dissonances could not be counterbalanced any longer by occasional returns to such tonal triads as represent a key. Schoenberg went through this evolution gradually. Pieces which are right in between the two periods, right on the edge of tonality, are for example his rather strange Kammer symphony, which he saw as the pinnacle of his first period, and the famous second string quartet, which can be seen as a transition between the two periods. Both these pieces caused scandals at the first performances. In the string quartet, the soprano comes in for the last movements, and the soprano famously sings... And then she sings... Ich fühle Luft... von anderen Planeten. Among other things, in these pieces the harmony is very complex and one feels that there is something new building up. I recommend to listen to those pieces. This of the second string bucket, Opus 10, which is a transition to the second period, this period which renounces a tonal sector, but is falsely called atonality. After a lot of thinking and trying things out, but also self-encouraging, Schoenberg finally made the decisive step into atonality. That means music where classical traditional harmonic rules are abandoned and where there is no tonal center and basically every combination of notes is possible. But that being said, it doesn't mean that suddenly everything is forgotten or that every note is random. There are still some kind of remains of traditional harmonic principles here and there and Schoenberg, who understood harmony incredibly deeply, chose every note very carefully. Some of the first pieces composed in this new manner are the Lieder der Hängenden Gärten or the three piano pieces, Opus 11. But I want to show you another example and it's the Intense Five Pieces for Orchestra, Opus 16, which actually were composed during the same year as the piano pieces. <laughs> This second period of Schoenberg is characterized by extreme and direct, even violent expression. Schoenberg then felt the need to have some kind of a new system. Since the tonal system had been abandoned, it was rather difficult to compose larger, cohesive and organized works. Because basically in tonal works you could always organize your music around harmonic regions and you would begin with your home key and, you know, the dominant and close harmonic regions and explore more and more distant harmonic regions until you find your way back home. And in free atonal music there was no way of doing that, there was no such system. One sign of that is that many of the free atonal pieces by Schoenberg and his pupils were vocal pieces. Since they were based on texts it was easier to structure the pieces, but for instrumental music it was difficult to compose larger works. So many of the early atonal works are very short pieces. Schoenberg therefore invented the 12 tone technique. This technique essentially consists of putting all the 12 chromatic pitches in a certain order this is called the row, and then basing a whole composition on this row and variations of it. This technique allowed the composer to create larger works again, 
and guaranteed cohesion throughout the work since everything in a 12-tone piece stems out of the initial 12-tone row. Instead of relating every configuration in a piece to a tonal center, every configuration in a 12-tone piece is related to the ground piece part. In that it consisted of always the same tone relation as this Schoenberg and some of his students saw this technique as somewhat the ultimate goal of the Germanic tradition of composition until then. And by that they meant that since the early Renaissance music through Bach and Beethoven, Brahms and so on, there was always a search for cohesion of the musical material, a search for interrelation and connection um, between the musical elements. And since in a dodecaphonic piece everything stems out of one single 12 tone row, this allows the most coherence possible. The 12 tone technique should also make the pieces more comprehensible and intelligible. Schoenberg and some of his pupils often talk about this Fasslichkeit in German, which means understandability or graspability. And the cohesion which is created through the 12 tone technique should make a piece clearer and more graspable. It is in first respect a method ascertaining logical order and organization of which comprehensibility should be the main result. One example of a 12-tone piece is Schoenberg's fourth string quartet. Before we move on to the piano pieces, I want to point some things out. First of all, that Schoenberg was always very closely connected to Western classical musical tradition and never wanted to break with it. He wanted to continue this tradition. He is often seen as this radical revolutionary composer, but he himself never saw himself that way. Of course his music was very new and extreme in some aspects, but it was always linked to tradition in many ways. And to give some examples, I mean, he still composed for traditional musical formations like the string quartet, he often refers to traditional musical forms in his pieces, he still wrote melodies, themes, phrases, he used musical motifs and varied them just like Beethoven or Brahms, he was very fond of counterpoint and so on, there are many things like that. And he once said that he actually just tried to be a, a better Tchaikovsky. What about these accusations of anarchy and revolution? While it was distinctly evolution, no more exorbitant than that which always has occurred in the history of music. The second thing is that actually Schoenberg always was a romantic composer in his approach to music and composition throughout his life. And by that I mean that he saw music as a form of subjective expression of feelings, emotions, thoughts, musical ideas, moods and so on. And he always wanted to express himself through his music. And many people and also many musicians still say that Schoenberg's music is brainy, head music, especially about the 12-tone pieces, and that he is a very technical composer and so on, but that's actually not the case at all, or at least he is not more technical than, let's say, Beethoven. And Schoenberg never wrote music for the sake of a technique. So I uh, planned to tell you what painting meant, meant to me. In fact, it was to me the same as making music. It was to me a way of expressing myself, of presenting emotions, ideas and uh, other feelings. I never was uh, very capable of expressing my feelings or emotions in words. 
The three piano pieces Opus 11 were composed, like I said, right at the beginning of Schoenbeck's new period of free atonality. After going already very far in respects to harmony in the pieces like uh, the Kammer Symphonie or the Second String Quartet, this work was a really important step forward. It is interesting historically but also compositionally. It was Schoenbeck's first purely instrumental atonal work. In these piano pieces we can observe what Schoenbeck called the emancipation of the dissonance. It touches on what I said earlier about atonality and basically means that every combination of notes is possible and that dissonances are just as valid as consonances or actually kind of more valid. But in these early atonal pieces there are also some kind of remains of traditional harmony which we will see later. And actually there are also some kinds of roots, for example simple consonant triads were not used because of stylistic and formal reasons. But these pieces were not only very modern regarding the harmonic aspect but also structurally or pianistically speaking. Schoenberg composed these pieces in 1909. He composed the first two pieces earlier that year and after a couple of months he composed the third one. During this year he also composed his five orchestral pieces Opus 16 which I mentioned. And to give you some examples of other composers, in 1909 Mahler wrote his ninth symphony Debussy wrote his first book of Preludes for Piano and Stravinsky wrote his Firebird. The three piano pieces Opus 11 were actually the first official solo piano pieces by Schoenberg. He often used the piano as an instrument to explore new styles of composition and the piano stands at important moments of his development. His piano pieces more or less trace his three periods. He started out writing lots of romantic songs for piano and voice, then started writing atonal pieces with the songs Opus 15 and the three piano pieces Opus 11, and also some of the first 12-tone pieces were for piano. It was maybe a way of exploring these new kinds of composition and expression through a rather limited and compact medium. Schoenberg's piano writing style is unique and untypical, or as Glenn Gould said, Schoenberg does not write against the piano, but neither can he be accused of writing for it. The pianist Else Kraus played Schoenberg's complete piano works very early on and got to work with him very often. In a text about the pieces Opus 11 she remembers what was important to him. He wanted the tempo to be stable and that all the tempo variations were in relation to the main tempo. Every voice was to be treated with care, none should be neglected. Every line had to have its own expressivity, dynamic phrasing and so on. The staccati had to be as short as possible, the legati as singing as possible. And you should sing wholeheartedly what you could but with as little pedal as possible because it would make the polyphony unclear and furthermore Else Kraus remembers that he always knew exactly the characteristics of every instrument that he knew how every musical line should sound and that he was very passionate about the expressivity of a piece and one last remark is that nothing was soft or lyrical enough for him the title Drei Klavierstücke alludes to Brahms' various cycles of Klavierstücke. Those piano pieces, let's say Opus 118 for example, were composed not even 20 years before Schoenberg's. What they have in common is the shortness, the concentration, but also the intimacy and the strong expressivity. One thing that Schoenberg pushes further, but that is already present in Brahms' music, is the idea of developing variation. It is the idea that in a piece you have few basic motifs, build everything out of them, but never exactly repeat them. You vary and develop them all the time. In Schoenberg's music, everything is constantly changing. The work as a whole has traces of a classical sonata, with a complex first movement, which even has a form resembling the sonata form, a slow second movement, and a grand finale as a third movement. The first two pieces are still based on traditional forms, are very elaborate concerning the motivic work, and also have a lot of tonal illusions. The third one, which is the most extreme of the three pieces, on the contrary, tries to break free from any form motivic work, harmonic relationships and any traditional piano writing style. In this video I'm going to focus mainly on the first piece, but I'm still going to say some things about the other two. Let's start and look closely at the first piece. I mostly base my analysis on the whole book about these pieces by Reinhold Brinkmann, because I think that he just does a great job and understands this music very well. To again quote Glenn Gould, Opus 11 number 1 is a masterpiece. Judged by any criteria, this glorious vignette must rank with the very best of Brahms intermezzos. What's characteristic of this piece is that it's very concentrated. You must imagine all the expressivity of these massive pieces like the Gure Lieder that is condensed into these few piano notes. It is motivically very elaborated and has lots of strong contrasts. These are created through outburst moments like sudden eruptions where everything in the music changes. We will soon see an example of that. Its form reminds us of a three-parted form with a thematic exposition a middle section and a reprise at the end. And basically the whole piece consists of a conflict between the thematic 
motivic, clearer, more grounded or seemingly more organized parts and these contrasting eruptive disruptive outburst moments. The analysis of Brinkmann focuses mainly on this aspect of conflict and contrast. I will first show you the overall form of the piece, then we're going to look at the bars 1 to 11 in which the thematic material is exposed, then we're going to look at the first outburst moment beginning at bar 12, and finally we're going to look at the whole piece referring to these first bars. So let's look at the overall form. I marked the thematic parts in blue and the contrast in outburst moments in red. As you can see, there are four outburst sections and in between there is always thematic material where motifs of the exposition are used. The climax of the piece, beginning at bar 49, is a combination between the thematic material and outburst material. After it comes the reprise with a little surprise at the end. And we will look at this closer moving on. Now let's examine the bars 1 to 11 before the first outburst. The first 11 bars are structured in an A, B, A prime form which consists of an opening first section where the main theme is stated, a contrasting middle section, and a concluding section which reuses the material of the first one. So we have three measures of A, five measures of B, and then three closing measures of a slightly varied A again. A and A prime clearly consists of a melody with accompanying chords, while B consists of three different entangled lines. The melody of A is the main theme of this piece, it is a very clear, descending, almost traditional opening phrase with even a closing suspension at the end. It clearly articulates the 3-4 time signature and that the most important notes are on the heavy beats. This theme has a span of a perfect fifth. It starts on B natural and ends on E natural. Also note how the note G is in the middle of this fifth. This G is introduced chromatically by the note above G sharp. Same goes for the final E, which is preceded by F as a suspension. This combined with the decrescendo makes the theme lead towards E natural. With the perfect fifth and the G and G sharp plus the suspension, we have many elements reminiscent of tonality. The accompanying chords join this melody on the second beats of measures 2 and 3 and create dissonances. Notably, the bass note is strongly dissonant to the melody note. And these chords go in contrary motion to the melody, so while the melody goes down, the chords go up. Now let's look at the construction of this main theme. You can divide the theme in various motifs, and this will be important for the later analysis for recognizing which motifs get varied throughout the piece. So we have A, which is the whole main theme, Then we have the main motif of this theme, which consists of a descending minor third and a minor second that we will call M for main motif. And this motif is immediately followed by a variation of it. And so we actually already see the principle of varying motifs right at the beginning after only three notes. And we can Divide this furthermore in little one bar motif cells, which I will mark with MC for motif cells. And there we have MC1 consisting of the first two notes. MC2 consisting of the following three notes, which is in the center of the theme. And MC3 consisting of the final two notes. So we have all these different motifs plus their inversions and retrograde forms which can be taken out by themselves and used, varied and combined in many ways. We will see what Schoenberg does with them later on. So the main theme ends with this E natural but it doesn't feel closed. It feels more like a half cadence than a perfect one. And this is due to many reasons and you could look at harmonic details but what's important is that it feels like an open end which is understandable since in the three-parted form, it is the first statement and not the closing one. After this theme A comes theme or section B, which is different in many ways. It is more polyphonic, so you don't have a melody and an accompaniment anymore, but three distinct lines together. The theme B does not articulate the 3-4 time signature clearly as the theme A did. 
It consists mostly of ascending gestures. It is not one single phrase or line, but consists of various mini sections. And so the three different lines that I talked about create a little motif group, which is like a little unit. And this unit is then immediately repeated with variations. So B consists of three little sections or motif group units. In these three sections, there are three motifs, which we will call B1, B2, and B3. And they keep the same notes and register, but are always combined differently. B starts with an E natural in the highest voice. So it begins where theme A ended. And this is a fifth underneath the beginning B natural of the main theme. If you look at the tone disposition of A and B, you can clearly see that B is related to A. So theme B begins where theme A ended with an E natural, has G natural as its main note with a B natural underneath, just like in theme A, and ends with a B natural with which theme A began. Now let's look at the motifs of theme B. We have these two closely connected motifs B1 and B2, which get varied and stretched. And then we have the motif B3, which stays the same but shifts. If we look at the beginning of theme B, we can see that the motif B1 consists of a rising minor third which is the inversion of the opening interval. Furthermore, we can see that through the combination of B1 and B2, there is a variation of the main theme M that is created. Instead of a minor third and a minor second, we here have both major intervals. Through these varying motif group units, the different motifs get always more independent and separated from one and another. And this happens through the lengthening of the note values, but also of the pause values. So in total, the motif group units get longer. At the same time, you can see how the emphasis point gets always blurrier. So the G natural is the main focus in the first unit and then gets blurred throughout the process. So in the motif group unit two, it is already less prominent because it doesn't come simultaneously with the other motifs and in the third unit the G doesn't stand out anymore. In the third motif group unit the different motifs are so separated from one and another that the motif B3 is now like an answer to B1 and B2 and the added motif B4 plus the decrescendo give this third motif group unit a closing character inside this whole B section. As you saw here in section B, we also have a lot of motivic material and this too will be varied throughout the piece and the motifs of section B will be combined with the motif of section A and we will see examples of that later. So we had theme A, theme B and now comes A prime as a conclusion. metric ambiguity of theme B is restabilized by the returning main theme and it is even more stable in a sense because the tempo gets slower. The theme now has varied and augmented intervals and also has a crescendo that leads towards and reinforces these larger leaps. It starts on F sharp which is a perfect fifth above the original theme and this is again a remain of traditional harmony. It's like a response on the dominant. The main motif M is here augmented to a major third and a major second and actually this was somehow prepared by theme B. We also have an inversion of the last minor second that we called MC3 for motif cell 3 and this adds to the conclusive effect of this three-parted AB A prime form. So if the semitone downwards indicated a half cadence, now we have the perfect cadence. And interestingly this ends with a B flat. We would expect a B natural because we had this perfect fifth relationship between B natural and E natural and F sharp and also we would return to the first note of the piece but instead we have this B flat at the end and we will see how we can explain this later. 
but so we have this a prime and now we have a closed a b a prime structure the whole piece is constructed with these motifs that were presented in this opening section and it is meticulously motivically organized the motifs are strongly varied and combined in very creative ways continuously throughout the whole piece Although most of the piece is motivically organized, there are also amotivic sections. These are the eruptive outburst moments, which I mentioned. Brinkmann also calls these disintegration, dissolving or disorganization fields. These stand in complete contrast to the strongly motivic and thematic parts of the piece. We will now look at the first one of these moments or fields, which follows the AB A prime opening of the piece and it's the outburst in bar 12. So suddenly every musical parameter changes abruptly with this fast rising figure which quickly falls back down again. Firstly let's look at the expansion of the register. While the opening had a rather limited and fixed register, we now have a gesture that goes all over the keyboard. Have the dynamics so suddenly we are in pianississimo plus the left dampening pedal which makes it even softer. Schoenberg didn't choose the more obvious contrast of changing the dynamic to fortissimo but instead went in the other direction and made this outburst as quiet as it could possibly be. Then the tempo changes too so Schoenberg adds the marking viel schneller so a lot faster and the note values also get a lot shorter. In the opening section, the shortest note value was an 8th note, and now it's a 32nd note. These two things combined make this outburst feel like a sudden acceleration. Then, of course, the metric feel is completely lost. There's absolutely no pulse anymore, and Schoenberg does that by not accentuating the heavy beats of the bar, but instead we feel different notes being accentuated at different moments, which are not at all on heavy beats, but feel like one. And this creates rhythmic confusion. And already as a combination of these different musical parameters that have changed together, we have an overall new and different sound quality, a completely different texture and color as before. If we look further within this first outburst section, after this sudden gesture, we can see that it stays within a larger range, it's still in pianississimo, there are still fast note values and the rhythm is still confusing. In addition to that, Schoenberg uses a piano technique that was very unfamiliar at that time to really explore the different colors of that instrument. It's the so-called piano flageolet in which you silently press keys and play the same notes some octaves slower with short and loud attack so that the overtones of the strings of the held keys can sound. In this case it is this F A C sharp E chord which is held down and the left hand plays the same notes in sforzato in the low register of the piano. The main notes of this figure, so F, C sharp and E, can be traced back to the main motif. It is actually the main motif inverted. So out of this moment re-emerges thematic material. It slowly goes back to the main theme which is again interrupted by the sforzato figure in the bass. This figure is quite singular in that it doesn't return during the whole piece. In addition to creating this colorful flageolet effect, it has the role of creating contrast between the eruptive and the thematic that is re-emerging. So it's like a little remain of the outburst that doesn't let the theme return again so easily.
another point of contrast between the thematic opening and this first outburst moment we can look at is the harmony. We had seen that the thematic section functions with a lot of thirds and now in contrast to that the outburst gesture starts with stacking of fours. The fundamental note of this fourth stacking is E flat. Same goes for the bass figure in the next bar. And Schoenberg consciously didn't use the note E flat until this point and now it is the central note of this whole outburst section. And this contrasts of course with the main theme and the whole opening which like we saw was leaning towards E natural. The amotivic aspect is the last contrast between these two sections. So we had the motivic beginning in which we had clear and recognizable motifs and now we have this amotivic outburst which starts with this unexpected gesture. And it is not a motif, it is a gesture and, and a movement. And while everything is constructed with the same few motifs in the thematic sections, the outburst fields are unbounded and function more with gesture and color. So you see that this outburst or disintegration field brings with it a sense of freedom. The music is not bound to anything, it is impulsive and full of colors and new gestures, but still we can look at ways in which this eruptive moment is prepared and constructed. It is very carefully done. So firstly, Brinkmann says that the rhythmic ambiguity in theme B is already a kind of preparation to the outburst moment. The rhythmical destabilization is announced, so to say. He also sees the stretched interval in A prime as a preparation too. It's like a distortion that announces the more important distortion that's going to come. We also saw how the opening section ends with this ascending half step A natural to B flat. This B flat is the fifth above E flat and leads to this central note of the disintegration field. And interestingly, this fifth fall is interrupted by B natural, which would lead towards E natural. Furthermore, just as the opening section had central notes, the outburst section has its central notes too. In this case, they are E flat and C sharp. And if we look further, we can see that in the right hand, we have notes that can be associated with the main theme if we place them differently. In the left hand we have this gesture which slowly rises and starts on E flat and then on E natural and this leads to the flageolet which ends with the coming back to the main theme and here also the sforzato figures lead to E natural. So you can clearly see how Schoenberg led us from the opening section, which had E natural as its central note, to the outburst field with E flat as its central note, back to thematic material again with E natural as its main note. And progressively we come back to the main theme in its A prime form. So this eruptive disintegration field, which when listening feels like an outburst of expressivity, something impulsive and uncontrolled or unorganized is still part of a larger structure and is very skillfully and carefully put together by Schoenberg. And he himself said, in my first works in the new style, I was particularly guided in both the details and the whole of the formal construction by very powerful expressive forces, not to mention a sense of form and logic acquired from tradition and well developed through hard work and conscientiousness. So I think we understood the first page of this piece a bit better now. It contains the most important ideas of this piece and it will be easier to understand the rest now. So we can continue and I will guide you through the whole piece. After the main theme A has returned, we have a variation of the theme B that follows in bar 19 in sehr langsam, which means very slow. And we again have a complex of three distinct motifs that interact with each other. And again, we have two varied repetitions of a motif group unit. This time the rhythm is more stable and the meter is clearer. The different elements are more clearly separated from each other than the first time and the motifs B1 and B3 are easily recognizable from before, but the motif B2 is changed more heavily. As we saw in the first appearance of theme B, the third motif B3 was getting more and more separated and became like an answer to the motifs B1 and B2. In this varied form of theme B, this is immediately the case. The ascending line, that is the motif B3, 
is like an answer to E1 and 2. The dynamic contrast between B1 and 2 and B3 also reinforces this, and so does the different articulation. The third motif group unit clearly marks an ending again. First, the direction of the motif B1 changes and now goes down a minor third. Then the motif B3 follows and falls down a major third and an augmented triad. Plus there is a ritardando and a diminuendo. next section begins a bit faster, in mäßig, which translates to moderate, and is the main tempo again. You can often recognize the different formal section of the piece by the different tempo marking. This section consists of a fugato, which is a polyphonic imitative play between different voices with one same motif. In this case we have a falling motif. It is connected to the very B3 motif we just had in the right hand in that it begins with a falling augmented triad starting on E flat. It then morphs into a variant of the main theme. So you already see how A and B motifs are combined. main notes of these motifs are F-sharp, E-flat and B-flat and so they outline an E-flat minor triad. The final notes of this passage are E-natural, A-natural and D-natural, which form a fourth chord. So this harmonically prepares the second very short outburst moment, which comes in the next bar. This is marked by the tempo change, rasha, which means faster, plus the 16th notes. So we are again suddenly faster. Furthermore, the gesture is contrasting to what just happened. While we had falling motifs in the fugato, we now have strikingly rising figures. Furthermore, we are left with only two voices here. The first begins with a rising gesture based on thirds, which could be associated with the B3 motif. And I know I said the outburst sections are amotetic, but we will see that this is actually ambiguous. And then the second voice joins in with a rising gesture based on fourths, similar to the first outburst in the bar 12. This is emphasized by a crescendo. And also the range is again a little bit more expanded and the metric feel is lost through the tempo changes but also the different accents. This outburst moment is very short and we then return to a thematic polyphonic section which reminds us again of theme B and this is marked again by the change of tempo. The dynamic is now forte and we only have intertwined motivic material from the themes. This is actually a good example to show how the different elements from theme A and theme B are combined and how certain motifs can get confused for one another. And so we have a varied form of motif cell 1 in the upper voice, so the falling major third. Then we have a varied motif cell 2 in the lowest voice. And finally a varied retrograde form of motif cell 2 in the middle voice. This motif group unit is then repeated twice, so it reminds us of theme B. And actually you could see some of these motifs as coming from theme B. So the repeating major third in the upper voice is an inversion of the motif B1. The resulted major third C natural and E natural also makes this relationship clear. And then the three falling chromatic notes in the middle voice could be the inversion of the ending of the motif B3.
The repetitions of these motifs lead us to a conclusion, a cadence-like ending. We have a decrescendo that leads us from forte to pianissimo. We also have a change in register and jump to the low register of the piano. And here we have the inverted motif cell 3 in the upper voice, so the rising half step. Underneath that we have the last part of the theme A. And if we take the F sharp and D natural from the upper voice in the preceding bar, we even have a complete varied form of theme A. This is followed by the last part of theme A in octaves, in pianissimo and in the low register, and this clearly indicates an ending of a section. So we basically had varied forms of the themes A and B, and I think you could see the complexity of the motivic work here. This was the larger first section of the piece. Now begins the large middle section, which is more agitated and which is characterized by this new dotted rhythm, which will be present throughout the whole section. It begins with yet another tempo, a bit faster, fließender, and in pianissimo. We have a new gesture and rhythm, which at first seem kind of unrelated to what had just happened before, but if we look closely, it is again derived from the main theme. It's actually a canon with the main theme. If you look at the right hand, the lower voice in the thumb plays the slightly varied theme A without the repeated note at the end. The upper voices in the right hand play it very shortly afterwards in parallel thirds. thirds are more prominent so you don't really perceive a canon because of the shortness of the lower notes which act more as grace notes a minor ninth below the highest voice. And if you put the notes of the lower voice and the parallel thirds together you end up with the inverted motif as a chord. If we look at the range of the theme, we see that it spans a perfect fourth in the lower voice from E natural to B natural and a perfect fifth in the higher parts from F natural to B flat. So the fifth range of the main theme that we had at the beginning is still present. In the left hand we have a fast succession of minor ninths, which could be derived from various motifs. This whole thing is then immediately varied and basically we had a very varied canonic form of theme A. Now follows something that is related to theme B again. As we saw at the beginning of the piece, theme B began with the last note of theme A. This is also the case here in bar 38. The varied theme A ends with the major third G natural, B natural and then the varied theme B begins with the same third. This varied theme B is very short and very changed, but what reminds us of theme B are the three voices. The minor ninth grace notes remain from the bars before. The middle voice is the nearest from the middle voice of the original theme B. It is a combination of B and A motifs, and Trimbeck basically morphs one into the other. So the first three notes stem from the motif B2. And the last three notes from the motif cell too. In the highest voice we have again only two notes but the interval and the direction is changed and the lower voice is only related in that it's rising. This B related section is as I said very short because it's interrupted by another outburst and disintegration moment. This time it's a bit less sudden because it's introduced by a crescendo, but again everything changes and is contrasting. It begins again with this rising gesture which we remember from the first outburst moment in bar 12. And here again we came from a motivic and polyphonic texture to this outburst which is more about gesture and color. Again the register expands and we have faster note values. We even have the returning note motif before the rising figure 
exactly like in bar 12. And this motif also retraces the perfect fifth relationship we had before. The little motif starts on the F sharp and leads to the rising gesture starting on B natural. This little motif is then augmented, which means that it is in longer note values and starts on an E natural and leads to an A natural. At this point, the gesture changes and we have this very fast and disorienting moment in which the range is even more expanded to the low register. So here we have two voices, one in each hand, which basically play the same motifs in shifted contrary motion. So the right hand is descending while the left hand rises. These motifs consist again of mainly minor ninths and are similar to the lower voice we had in the bars before. What makes this so disorienting is the rhythm and the displacement between the two voices. And furthermore, this very fast moment is in pianissimo, which creates this strange overall texture. This is followed by yet another gesture, which is related to the returning note motif we just saw and the rising gesture, which is more or less compacted into an arpeggiated chord. This moment reminds us a little bit of the bars 14 to 16 because of the sforzato juxtaposed with the pianissimo and also because in both cases it brings the disintegration field back to thematic material. But of course it is only loosely related and as you could see in the last couple of bars Schumach always comes up with new textures, new gestures and movement. The next section begins with the same notes we had in bar 36 which were the variant of theme A but it continues with the very very form of theme B we had before. We have again three distinct voices and again the minor ninth is very prominent. The dynamic is very agitated and goes from forte to pianissimo very quickly. We have an overall descending gesture which leads us to bar 45 in which we are in the very low register of the piano and in pianissimo. Here we have the same gesture in the right hand that we had from bar 34 onwards. In the left hand starting from bar 46 we have the main theme again, separated by short little rests, starting from B flat and spanning again a perfect fifth to E flat. <laughs> It's not a coincidence that we have the main theme in E-flat here. Um, we have again contrary motion between the lower voice and the upper voices. The right hand is rising as the left descends. And we have a crescendo at the end of the section which leads us to the build up to the climax of the piece. Have here again the same notes as in bar 36 and 42, which I remind you stem out of the main motif. The middle voice has the motif that is a mix of B and A elements again, and in the highest voice we have a retrograde of the main motif with major third. But there's also a connection to the theme B with the major third, C natural, E natural and G sharp. It's like a retrograde. Following that, in bar 49, in the left hand we have the motif cell 2, similar to what we had in bar 29. This is already in forte and we have a big crescendo at the same time. At the end of the bar we have an accelerando and new elements join in. The right hand plays this jumping rising gesture while the left hand plays syncopated three note chords rising in big octave jumps which are based on E flat. If we examine that we can see that the right hand plays the same thing we had in bar 13 extended by two notes. left hand also plays almost the same thing as in bar 13 but in chords. And the note 
notes of the first chord put in different order also form the main motif. <laughs> We then reach the climax of the piece, in which the left hand plays the outburst rising gesture from bar 12, almost with the exact same notes, this time with the first E flat doubled with an octave before and in fortissimo and martellato, which means hammered and with accents. So it's really the extreme brutalized version of this gesture that first appeared in pianissimo and with dampening pedal. <laughs> This gesture is then varied two times, the dynamic is quickly changed and contrasted to pianissimo and the lowest notes of the gesture get a bit higher. Note how the lowest notes following the E flat are G natural and B natural, so notes associated with the main theme and with the central tone E natural. So you can really find these kinds of details everywhere. While this violent gesture began with E flat and was in the foreground, it now becomes softer and gives more space to the right hand. This leads us to the right hand, which plays a varied main theme in the highest voice, starting from G sharp, mostly with thirds and the middle voices. The right hand also begins in fortissimo and quickly goes to pianissimo. <laughs> If we look at the notes of the first chords the right hand has, we have the notes E natural, G natural and G sharp which are associated with the main theme and this is put against the outburst gesture in the left hand centered on E flat. <laughs> This climax is really the direct confrontation of these two fighting elements. Reinhold Brinkmann talks about this conflict between the thematic and the outburst and that this climax is the final integration of the outburst moment. Schoenberg gives this climactic moment a lot of importance in that the essential idea of the piece that is the conflict or the tension between the thematic and the outburst is in the main focus here. There is a reminiscence of the sonata form in the conflict between these two opposing poles. After this climax we have the reprise in which the main theme returns starting on the original note E natural for the first time since the very beginning of the piece. The theme is still varied though. Nothing gets repeated exactly the same way in this piece. It starts in octaves and is prolonged and also there are other things going on in other voices. In bar 54 the left hand plays the motif B3 <laughs> But at the same time, it now appears as being closely related to the outburst gesture that just happened some bars earlier. This is partly because of the faster note values and because the first two notes are played successively for the first time. So this means that the outburst is really finally integrated into the thematic fabric. It is confusable and the conflict is more or less solved, you could say. And in retrospect, you could say that the motif B3 is related to the first outburst moment in bar 12. Brinkmann talks about the sonata form being in the background of this piece and that there is an exposition of the themes which serve as material for the development and this is evident through the simplicity of the main theme which cries out to be varied and developed. Then there is the development which is the core of the piece and has a, a direction, it leads towards something and then finally the reprise is the result of this development. It's consequence of the process. And if here the process was to carry the conflict between thematic and outburst and to integrate the outburst, then this process has reached its goal in the reprise. But um, this is discussable of course. So but let's look further into the piece. In the right hand we have chords joining the main theme. The left hand plays these thirds and octaves which could be associated with the motif B1. crescendo and then the B2 motif joins in the middle voice with accents on every note. It gets repeated and a little varied, intensifies and then we quickly
quickly arrive at the dynamic of piano. We saw how elements from theme A and theme B were combined all the time after the opening section, but here we have really the clear main theme A combined with the motifs from theme B, which didn't happen before. So this could also be seen as a result of the interplay and all the different combinations we had of A and B motifs in the development, the final togetherness of the two, so to say. And finally we have a short coda. We are in the low register of the piano. In the right hand we have a three note chord in sforzato that resembles the chords of the climax and is associated with the outburst. In between the two upper voices the varied main theme appears in piano with diminuendo. It is then passed to a lower voice and then goes back to the highest voice and this passing around of elements of the main theme to different voices is a typical way of ending a piece. You can find that in piano pieces by, by Beethoven and so on. So the last varied A motifs are left out to a single line in pianissimo which falls down to this E natural in octaves. This single voice left alone, the very soft dynamic, the diminuendo and the falling gesture of the line creates a clear feeling of an end. And this would actually be a solid ending in that the main theme that had E natural as its central note now descends to it at the end of the piece, but Schoenberg decided to then unexpectedly descend to an E flat. With this last E flat we have a sudden chord that appears on top of it. This chord consists of the fourth we had in bar 12, so the first outburst moment is really re-emerging as a surprise and makes this ending a lot more agitated. And if we look at the first outburst moment again, we can see that it's really connected to the very ending of the piece. As I said before, in bar 11 we have the A natural going to B flat, which should lead us to the outburst moment starting on E flat. This trajectory is shortly interrupted by a B natural, which would lead us to E natural. So as you see, there's this harmonic play between these two poles of E natural and E flat, which kind of represent the thematically organized sections and the chaotic outburst sections, and this is present at many moments during the whole piece. And now at the end we have something similar. Again we have A natural, which goes to B flat, or in this case A sharp, but then it goes to E natural before we have this sudden shift to E flat. So this last flash of the outburst really makes us wonder if the conflict is really solved or not. It gives us a sense of instability and insecurity. So, concluding, we could say that in this piece Schoenberg really confronts order and chaos, that is, thematic, motivically organized parts and eruptive, outbursting, amotivic parts. A conflict is presented and it's like these hyper-expressive outburst moments try to break the organized fabric. But we also saw that the seemingly chaotic parts of the piece are very carefully put together. To oppose these two poles we saw how Schoenberg contrasts everything. He even uses some kind of traditional harmonic principle of contrast in that he uses different central notes for the two poles, so E natural for the thematic and E flat for the outburst. During the piece the conflict is dealt with and we end up in this ambiguous position of integration of the outburst or integration of the chaos into the order, but which is still not clear at the end. Of course, we also saw how elaborated the motivic work is in this piece, how almost everything stems out of few small motifs, like in Beethoven or Brahms. So, but anyways, let's just quickly look at the other two pieces now. The second piece is like the slow movement of the whole thing. It is not as rich in contrast as the first piece, 
and it's characterized by this ostinato in the left hand, which occupies a large part of the piece. Like the first piece, it has three larger sections, which are again like a thematic exposition, a long middle section and a sort of recapitulation. The piece has many different smaller sections, which are clearly recognizable. There are clear breaks or cadences between them. Like the first piece, it is motivically elaborated and many of the things can be traced back to the main motifs that are presented at its beginning. What is unusual for Schoenberg is that we have some sections which are almost identically repeated during the piece. So we have constant variation of motifs, but at the same time, these variations sometimes reappear. If we look at the opening, we have again two themes, A and B. The second theme is expanded, and then we have the first theme re-emerging. So like the first piece, it's an A, B, A prime form. Then starts a long middle section, which consists of different smaller sections in which the material of the opening is strongly changed and transformed. It consists of little sections of different types. To me it almost feels like a collage of different moments. This middle section leads again to a big climax, which is using material from theme B. The music then calms down and after everything stands still, the last section begins. <laughs> Brinkmann points out that this is not like the reprise in the first piece. In the first piece, the reprise seemed like a necessary result of everything before and culminated directly out of the climax. In the second piece, first the climax calms down and leads to a static moment, and after that, the last section seems more like a, like a memory or a recapitulation of everything that has occurred during the piece. It is more like an attachment and not a necessity of a process. The piece ends with an E-flat again, and if you would analyze the harmony, you could see that this makes sense. Brinkmann actually shows how this whole piece tends towards E-flat, partly because of sections which are centered around E-flat, which leans towards E-flat. And actually, Schoenberg's pupil Anton Webern also talked about this. You can look further into that if you like to. Now, lastly, to the third piece, which is probably my favorite one. So I would not pretend that my piano piece of this 11 number 3 looks similar to a string quartet of Haydn. It was composed a couple of months later than the first two pieces, and Schoenberg was composing his big orchestral pieces, Opus 16, at the same time, like I said earlier. And the orchestral colors and the many polyphonic layers he elaborated in these pieces are evident also in this last piano piece. It is the big finale of the piece, the wildest, most violent piece, but also the one with the most contrast. So besides the loud, almost brutal moments, there are also incredibly tender passages. Unlike the other two pieces, there is no apparent use of traditional forms like the ABA form we saw. Basically, this piece consists of short moments which are very different from each other and which convey a feeling of freedom and of constant change and movement and newness. Schoenberg's pupil Anton Webern said about this piece, Once presented, the theme expresses everything it has to say. Something new must come. It's almost like the outbursts of the first piece are now everywhere in this last piece, but here they aren't really outburst moments since they constitute the whole piece basically. Each moment is a very clear unit and is very distinct in its shortness, its overall construction and its character. Among the three piano pieces, the third one is the most radical and extreme one regarding the form, but also regarding the harmony and that there are no harmonic poles, and also there are only remains of motivic connection. So it doesn't have this clear connection to tradition that we saw in the first two pieces. It actually functions mostly with gestures, dynamic, tempo, register and color. New characters had emerged, new moves and more rapid changes of expression 
had been created a new types of beginning, continuing, contrasting, repeating and ending had come into usage. Brinkmann divides the piece in these different moments or zones as he calls them. He says that you could differentiate between zones which have more of a thematic contour and zones which are more nebulous and blurry like a field of sound. But he insists on treating every moment as individual and recognizing its particularities. For example, the zone from bar 19 to 20 is a more thematically contoured one. <laughs> So is the one from bar 11 to 13. But they differ in every other aspect. The first one is in fortissimo, while the second one is in piano and sehr zart which means very tender. The first one has big compact chords and many layers, while the other one has only two simple voices and so on. In general, this piece is remarkably polyphonic. If you look at the opening, you immediately notice that there are three staffs and in each one there's at least one voice. zones or field-like moments are for example the one from bar 16 to 18 we have the left pedal plus the very soft dynamic to that we have the right pedal which is held down where we have these chords in the lowest and very highest register so everything is blurry and we don't recognize clearly what is happening in between those chords. It is so quiet in pianississimo, I think, and there are no clear shapes. It is more like a field of sound, as Brinkmann says. After this moment comes the powerful thematic zone that we just talked about. So you see how the principle of direct contrast is really the most important thing in this piece. Schoenberg constantly juxtaposes moments which are different in almost every way. <laughs> Let's come to an end now. As I said in the beginning, the whole work is somewhat remembering the classical sonata. The first piece being very complex and motivically very elaborated and even being somewhat reminiscent of the sonata form. The second piece being the slow movement with less contrast and the third piece being the grandiose finale. We also saw how Schoenberg used lots of traditional musical elements while still being very modern and new especially in the last piece. But anyways, this video is already long enough and I guess you could make your own conclusions. And I want to say again that I got almost everything from Reinhard Brinkmann and that if you speak German and are interested, I recommend his book. In my next video, I'm going to try to analyze a piece more by myself and I think it will probably be about Ligeti. So I hope this video was clear and informative. Let me know what you think about it. I am still not sure about many things since you know, I'm just a young student. I would be very happy to discuss some things in the comment section, especially if you don't agree with things. And yeah, thanks for watching and I will try to do this more often. 40 years have since proved that the psychological basis of all these changes was correct. Music without a constant reference to a tonic was comprehensible. Good produce characters and moods, could provoke emotions, and was not bare of being gay or humorous.